This is an interview with Vera Rossman, May 11th, 1990, 2.15 p.m., being interviewed by Fran Nolf. Ms. Rossman, could you tell me a little bit about yourself? I can tell you many things about myself as connected especially with the early days of Enid. Would you tell me some of the things? Shall I begin at the very beginning? If you would, yes, okay. please. Okay, I would like to do this. Um, as you know, all know what we mean when we say the run. Mm -hmm. When the United States government decided to open up this territory for settlement, they set a date in September at a certain day at 12 o'clock. If you were standing on the Kansas line, you could start running into Oklahoma and people came in by wagons and buggies and horseback and bicycle and some afoot and they would find a piece of land they wanted, they'd stake it out and it became their own. Now my grandfather made this run from Kansas and he came in a light buggy and made the run. He wasn't a farmer, but he came into Enid and got some lots in Enid and he built the first hotel here. It was called the City Hotel. He was a hotel man and this he, as soon as he staked it, the government had laid out the cities along the railroad line, set up a tent. They said, now here will be a city Enid, and they set up a tent. So everybody, when he staked his claim, would go to that tent and register with the government that that was his. So my grandfather registered these Enid lots where he built the hotel, and it became his. So the government had all this planned in advance. They even planned that the railroad would come through from Wichita South, it went in a straight line, and along that line, the government laid out Townsend for Enid, and Wacomas, and Kingfisher, and El Reno, and all these cities. Said, now here will be a city. And they laid out the lot for Enid. My grandfather built his hotel on the first block east of the square on Randolph. Now, he made the run in 93. By 95, he had the hotel built and operating. It was a two-story brick building. Half of it had the office and dining room and kitchen. The other half had in it a bakery where an expert baker baked all the goods for the hotel, but he also had a sales room in front where he sold baked goods to the public. Now upstairs there were 10 bedrooms. The city was beginning to get running water around the town in the middle of town. And so they had running water in this. They had one bathroom upstairs and 10 bedrooms. <laughs> then, of course, water in the kitchen. Well, in 1903, this hotel burned down. It just the whole thing just burned down. Interesting thing was my grandmother, realizing that the building would be gone, in her bedroom spread out a big bedspread and piled all her clothes and personal things in it, tied it in a big bundle. She carried it downstairs and across the street to save it from the fire. The next day it took two men to pick that bundle up and move it. What excitement does <laughs> for a person that they can't do ordinarily. Well, they had planned a retirement home on North Grand, intending to move out of the hotel anyway. So they moved up to their home. The 500 block on North Grand is this two-story, nice building, their home, and it is still standing there. I have a mm -hmm. picture of it. So they didn't, the hotel was never rebuilt. Well, in 1898, my parents came down from Kansas. My father practiced law there, came to Oklahoma, and in our, our right train on the ride from Topeka to Enid was very interesting for us on this Rock Island Railroad. And when we got off the train at Enid, there were two things that met every train that came into Enid. One was a hack and one was a dray. Now, in case you don't know what that means, the hack, we'd call it a taxi. It's a two-seated buggy with a fringe on top and a pair of team of horses hitched to it. And he brought all five of us from the depot to the hotel for 50 cents. The other dray, we would call a truck. It was a wagon, flat wagon with one horse, and he brings our trunk and our boxes and all of our baggage from the depot to the hotel for 25 cents. But that was money in those days. Mm -hmm. We'd been here perhaps a few weeks when my parents were able to buy a home at 301 East Maple Street. He bought a three-room wooden house, nice house. That was a really comfortable home. Great big rooms. The kitchen was so big, we cooked and ate and did the laundry and everything in that room. The bedroom was big enough for two double beds. My parents slept in one and we three little girls slept in the other one. And our living room was almost as big as this room. 
and it had a folding bed in it. Would you know what that is? No. It folded up against the wall, and it looked like a big cabinet. If we had guests, we pulled that bed down, made it up, and our guests slept in the living room. <laughs> so we were equipped for company. Well, with this house, we had about a half a block of ground. There was a big garden place, a chicken pen with the house, a big barn, everything we needed. And the, we were right up against the railroad track, the Rock Island Railroad track going north and south, made the boundary of our, the eastern boundary of our land. Well, the railroad company finally decided that they needed another track where they could sidetrack trains and trains could pass. And they would put it on the west side of the track that was there. And when they got on the west side of that, they came to the fence of our chicken pen. So one morning we woke up, they had taken down our fence and they laid the ties of a railroad right through our backyard. So the railroad never paid any damages. But not too long after that, our parents were able to sell this place and move so as not to have a railroad go through our backyard. Is that place still standing today? The, the house is not there, but there is a building on that corner where we stood. Now this was on the top of a hill to the north. You would go down a fairly steep hill. Boggy Creek went down through that hollow there, and people settled down there. In the spring, that creek flooded over everything. They all had to get out. So one family always came up and stayed with us till the flood went down. <laughs> we would expect that when there was a lot of rain. Well, some of, to show you how we lived in that house and got along and everything so good, uh, we didn't, didn't feel shut in or handicapped. Everybody was in the same condition, you know. Mm -hmm. Everybody in little frame wooden houses because the railroad just brought in lumber for the car loads and dumped it here so people could build. Well, in 1904, electricity came to Enid. Before that, we had lamps like that one. <laughs> and it was a problem to keep those lamps in working order. But when the electricity came, we had one light hanging down from the middle of the ceiling in every room, and that was wonderful. Mm. And at the same time, we had a telephone. We could have a telephone. We had electricity. The telephone hung on the wall. You reached up and cracked it, you know, and the central would say, this is central. You'd give her your number. But everybody in our neighborhood was on one line, and each one had their own ring. Now, our ring was two shorts and a long. It said, ding, ding, ding. When we heard that, we answered the phone, and so did everybody else on the line. <laughs> everybody, listen to everybody's business. That's the way the news got around. <laughs> so those, we didn't mind. Just careful what to say. <laughs> what year was that, do you 1904, think? 1904, the electricity mm -hmm. the telephone came yeah. in. And we were in this little three-room house, Mm -hmm. Now, we had a, my father bought a cow. There was a barn there and a lot, so he bought a cow. And uh, we, ch girls, my older sister and I, every morning, and when we could, we would take the cow to pasture. We'd go five blocks north, and that was a farm. And uh, my father made arrangements. They'd open the gate, we'd turn the cow into pasture. When we go back after that cow at five o'clock, she would stand right there by the gate. She was hurried, in a hurry to get home and be milked. Mm -hmm. And we sold milk to the neighborhood. I delivered milk at five cents a quart around over the neighborhood so that other people could have milk too. We had no running water, but just outside the kitchen door there was a pump. You know, a good old pump where you pumped your water out of the ground. <laughs> and uh, there uh, we kept a tub under the nozzle of that pump so there's no water wasted. And on laundry day, we had two tubs. There was a bench, mother would put two tubs, one hot soap tubs, and a washboard. Surely you all know what a washboard mm -hmm. is, where you scrub the things, then put them through a wringer into the tub of clear water to rinse them out. So it was the laundry. When it was bath time, every Saturday night, everybody had to have a bath. And the, the wash tub came into the kitchen and sat by the stove with nice warm water. And we started with the youngest. Mother would start with the youngest one. Now, according to age, everybody bathed in that tub of water. So we were nice and clean for Sunday. <laughs> that was our plumbing system. Mm -hmm. And of course, the outside toilet. Now the garden was large. We had fruit trees, raised all kinds of vegetables. Mother just canned everything. Beans, potatoes, fruit, everything. And we, under our kitchen, we had a cellar where the fruit was stored. And we, she didn't have glass jars. I remember that we used to buy syrup in a half gallon tin bucket. And we would save those buckets and she'd use them for canning. And she'd fill that with a, a half gallon of cooked peaches, put the lid on and run 
melted sealing wax around that lid to seal it up. And it kept perfectly in the tin buckets. So we had our food for the winter stored there. Well, that's the way we lived it on the first little home. We lived there till 1905. And 1905 is a dividing line in, as far as my memory goes. Everything I remember needed either happened before we moved when we lived there or after we moved to the west side and I connected for the two homes. So I can date them from before or after 1905. Well, let me tell you about Government Springs Park. That little hillside down there east of the railroad track, there's a long hillside where about eight springs came out of that hillside and they had been analyzed that each one was different chemically and they were supposed to be medicinal. And for ages, the Indians had gone there to take spring water. They would go and camp there. They thought it healed their diseases, and maybe it did. And when wagon trains began coming through here in the early days of pioneers, they always planned to camp about a week at the, they called it the springs, and where the spring water was. Well, in the early days, we would go to the springs and carry back buckets full of spring water to drink. We had plenty of water, but that spring water was good to drink. Everybody did that. Early days, people, everybody in town would go down there and get water. Finally, the city made it into a park, and then it was called Government Springs Park. Mm -hmm. And they built picnic tables, and they built a pretty little arch bridge over the creek, and put a dam in so that there would be a lake there. The creek water, spring water, formed a lake. It's still that way. And today, the government is reviving that park and redoing it now to make it Use, more usable for the people. Now, uh, when the, when the streetcar came to Enid, we it's hard to get the picture here of this. We had the square downtown and houses all around the streets. There were no pavements. There were no sidewalks. Only sidewalks were around the square downtown. And when uh, Phillips University came in 1907. It came really in 1905, took them two years to build up. The city realized we had, that was two miles east of the square, and Enid bought that farm and gave it to the university in order to get them to come here. And they built their three main buildings and a dormitory. Well, were they all going to have to walk two miles downtown to do shopping? So they got a streetcar line in here. I don't know how they did it, but we did. Mm -hmm. We had one east-west line, one north and south line. East-West went to the university, of course, that's the main thing. West, it went about a mile and a half west, and then north about a mile. There was a big lake out there, and the owner of that had been making a, a popular camping ground there, and he called it Lakewood. And the, we built the streetcar line out to Lakewood, and then the man developed it into a place where people could fish and swim and boat ride and camp, and it became a popular campground for Enid. And for a nickel, you could ride all the way out there. You could ride on any line for a nickel. You could transfer from one to the other on the same nickel downtown. So the streetcar really served a great purpose here in Enid, especially for Phillips University, people to go back and forth. Well, uh, after the streets were paved and cars came in later on, the streetcar line was taken out. It wasn't needed anymore. But I remember one thing. Every decoration day, my grandfather was a, uh, what we call an old soldier from the Civil War, and at one time, several years, he was the head of the Oklahoma DAR, very interested in what was done for old soldiers. And on Memorial Day, that was a big day of the year, uh, we'd have a big service downtown, and then everybody would form a parade to go to the cemetery, even before we had the street line. They'd use their wagons and buggies. And do you all remember what a hay rack is, was? The farmers had a big flat wagon where they could pile their hay on, mm -hmm. hay, bales of hay. Well, somebody would bring a hay rack, and all of us children from about 8 to 12 or 13 years old were appointed that day to put flowers on the graves. And we rode the hay rack. We had all the flowers. We rode on the hay rack and led the parade to the cemetery. And out there, We'd go to a grave of an old soldier and put up the flag. We children would put the flowers on the grave. The soldiers would fire their salute over the grave. We did this all over the cemetery. And that was a big day. After the streetcar came in, more people could go. They could ride the streetcar out there. But we did that long before that. Well, um, 
there was a, a definite, let me tell you about the square downtown. Okay. When the government men laid out the city of Enid, they planned a square to be the middle of town. They called it a square, but it was what is two square blocks now. We still call it that, but there's no cut through the middle. The courthouse was built in the middle, and in 1903 that courthouse burned down. And then they cut Broadway through and divided the two blocks as we have it now. Now all the buildings around the square were built of wood, of course. Right in those early days of the train bringing in wood, they were all wooden buildings, most all of them one story high. In 1903, the latter part of the year, the south side of the square burned down. Now we didn't have much of a fire department because it wasn't a very big water arrangement they needed, but they did the best they could. They couldn't save anything. But the, we had a fire bell, and when that bell clanged out that night in the middle of the night, woke everybody in town up. We all got up and went uptown to watch the fire. I was about seven years old. I remember looking there, standing and looking at those buildings, and what, what interested me, out of one of those fire buildings came a mother cat carrying a kitten. Oh. And she was so excited, you know, and she ran off up Main Street. And then I cried and I said to mother, that poor mama kitty can't go back after her other babies. Mm -hmm. And of course she couldn't in the fire. But that, that's my remembrance of the fire on the south side. Well, when that fire was over, the owners tore down all those buildings, cleared it off, and then we had brick buildings. We had a, a factory here needed making bricks then by that time, and all of the buildings were built, rebuilt in brick. And they were standing there until just a few years ago when we made our convention center. Mm -hmm. Now one is still there, the old Crest building. If you go down there and look at it up over the top, you find the word Crest. Every time I look at it, I wish that date was there, uh, the early in 1905 or the latter part of 1904. That store opened up for business. They said, on, at 9 o'clock on a certain day, we will be open. Mother gave me a dollar and said, you can go up to the Cress's opening and buy something, whatever you want. When I got up there, there was a block o a line over a block long, three deep, standing there to get in. At 9 o'clock when that door opened, open, it was a madhouse. They rushed in there in such crowds, you couldn't get through, you couldn't get to any counter. They grabbed things from each other and off the counters, it was terrible. Well, I squeezed in through there and got to the counter where Chinaware was sold, and I bought a little cup of saucer for a quarter. I have it right up there on the shelf. I didn't wait to buy anything else. I felt lucky to get out of there. <laughs> but that was the opening day of Chris. And of course, until recently, it is now a part of our civic center. It's still a beautiful building standing there. Well, all around the business stores around the square, there's a walk, a board walk, about 12 feet wide, so that the only walks in town were around the square. And out at the edge of them were hitching posts where farmers hitched their teams and horses when they came to town. So you could walk very comfortably. Now at that time we used to have terrible sandstorms here. I don't know why we don't have them anymore. Maybe the way the land's taken care of. But without any warning here would come a sandstorm or a, a, just dirt storm and it would be so thick you couldn't see a few to have of you. Every Saturday night in the early days, it was customary for everybody to come to town. It was a social occasion. You walked all around town, visited with all your friends in and out of the stores. One Saturday night while we were down, one of these sandstorms came up. We headed for home immediately, but before we got home, we had to hold on to each other. My daddy went first, and then three of us and then mother holding hands, and my father would lead us because we couldn't see where we were going. When we got home, everything in the house was covered with dirt. The houses were not tight. The dirt came in around the windows and doors. We had to take covers off the bed and shake the dirt off them. Usually, if we knew it was going to happen, Mother would put old rags in all the cracks around the windows and the doors. But even then, some dirt got in. Well, everything was good in those days. We had a few troubles. Uh, most of the people who made the run came from Kansas. And Kansas was what we called a dry state. They had no saloons, no liquor, intoxicating drinks, it wasn't allowed. So when people came down here were used to that sort of situation. Well, we didn't have a law like that. And when our square was built up, there were three or four saloons around that square where liquors were sold. I can remember seeing drunk men lying in ditches along the roads downtown. 
But we weren't used to that. My mother went uptown one day and she thought, went to go to a drugstore. She walked into a saloon. She thought it was a drugstore. The man came up here and said, lady, you get out of here. Women don't come in here. This is a saloon. Women weren't drinking in those days, I guess. <laughs> well, she got out. <laughs> and it was some time before, you know, saloons were done away with here, but fine. We don't have them either now. But we did then. We had saloons. And the saloons made money. In 1904, the first automobile came to Enid. And who do you suppose had money to buy that first car? I bet the bank. A saloon keeper. Oh, really? A saloon keeper. How and much? he lived in our block. Hmm. And he took all of us children to ride. So I rode the first car that ever oh, came to Enid. But the saloon keeper had money. Was it an electric car? No, it was a gasoline like car. Gasoline and it was a nice big mm -hmm. uh, touring car, you know. Well. It didn't have a top on it, an open car, but mm -hmm. it was a car. And soon cars began to come. Everybody got cars. Mm -hmm. Fords, you know. Uh -huh. Do you know what you could buy a new Ford for? What? When we bought our first new Ford, we paid $350 for it. Oh. And it was a sedan. Mm -hmm. it, you, you could put up curtains. We didn't have windows. You could hang up curtains on it, you know, to keep out the rain. <laughs> Well, cars came in, and then the city had to begin paving streets. They built sidewalks and paved streets all over town. But as, as things were needed, you see, why well, they, mm -hmm. they were taken care of in there. Now, my father, <coughs> father had been, a, <coughs> excuse me, had practiced law in Kansas, and he wanted to do that here. But this section of Oklahoma was not recognized yet as a legal place. Indian Territory was. It was a legal territory under the government, but not this western. And so in order to practice law here, my father had to go over into Indian Territory to Muskogee and take the bar examination and get any right to practice law in Indian, mm -hmm. which he did. And he was a city judge for a number of years and also a county judge. Well, uh, we had, there's some, one of the interesting things early about it must have been 1903 or 4. We had every summer what we called a children's concert. The woman who had charge of music in our public schools was a wonderful musician. She gathered together all every, every child that wanted to, from about four years old up till 12, were gathered together. And she trained them and practiced, taught them hymns. And we had an opera house on East Broadway, just a little east of the square, where there's a stage at the big auditorium. And there, at the end of the summer, they gave a concert. I was in those several years, I can remember. We sang old songs like uh, Mother in Heaven, trying to get to her, and songs that you don't ever hear anymore, children's songs. And the big concert of the, every summer, she gave this children's concert. And now and then, an opera company would come to Enid and put on a play in that opera house. So it was really made, made use of. Well. Let me outline some of the schools. I went to six different schools for my first eight grades. When we got here, the northern part of Enid was called Jonesville, that section. And up there, there's a little three-room wooden schoolhouse called the Jonesville School. And we being down on East Maple, my older sister and I started a school up there. We walked about six or seven blocks, mostly going north. And it was hard going in the winter against the north wind. I was in the first grade, she was in the third, and I did my first two grades at the Jonesville School. By the time I finished that, they had built a school across a railroad track, up above the springs on the hill, and it was called East Hill School. It was a brick building. And so uh, all of us from this school were transferred to that. And they kept, it grew so fast, they just kept building schools here and there. As fast as they get a new one built, they divide up the other one and move the children around. So I took my third grade on East Hill. Well, while we were there, the school board decided it wasn't a good idea for children to be crossing that railroad track twice a day going to school. So they made a new rule. Everybody east of the railroad would go to East Hill School. Everybody west of the railroad would go to some other school. And so they hurried up and built some other schools. And the first one was Jefferson School down there. But before Jefferson was ready, and I was ready for the fourth grade, there was no place for us to go. So they rented the Masonic Hall downtown on the corner of Main and Grand Avenue, that black building standing there, mm -hmm. all decorated up so pretty. It was a two-story building then. And the Masonic Lodge used the second floor. So the school board rented that and moved in school desks and blackboards. And our 
third and fourth grades went to school up there one year. We'd go up the stairs. At recess time, the police would block off that one block of Main Street for us to have a recess place to play. Well, by the time we finished that, Jefferson School was ready, so we all moved over to Jefferson on South Jefferson Street. And there I did my fifth and sixth grade. Now, by this time, my parents had moved away from East, East Maple over to West Oak Street. And so we walked from Oak Street about 10 blocks down to Jefferson School for these two grades. When we finished those two grades, by that time they had built Kenwood School. And that was over here right by Emerson, where Emerson is now, Emerson. I think the building's still there. And there I did the seventh and eighth grade. And since nobody ever heard of a junior high school at that time, we graduated from the eighth grade and then had four years in high school. So there I graduated from the eighth grade. Now, at Easter, uh, my, the, day, the year I graduated, I made myself a nice white dress out of dimity. My mother had taught me to sew, decorated with lace and insertion. Oh, beautiful. I wore it on Easter for the first time and then wore it for graduation. I have recently given that dress to the museum here in Eden. I don't know how I ever kept it all these years. <laughs> but I did. It was hanging here in my closet. I halfway promised it to a great granddaughter, but I decided it better go to the museum. <laughs> well, after graduating from the eighth grade then, while we were there, they started building the high school. You know, I'm getting ahead of the story. They had arranged a high school up where Jonesville School used to be. They built a two-story big brick building, big. Big enough that the whole second story was the high school. The whole first story was grades. So, I began my high school work there. And we, for three years and a half, we were in that building. Upstairs we had a nice auditorium, plenty of rooms. I remember one time of playing a piano solo for our assembly in high school up there. Uh, in our little three-room house, I forgot to say that we had a beautiful organ in our parlor. Uh, six or octave organ, which was very unusual, and we all took music lessons of it so that we were able to play some. Later on, they traded for a piano, of course. I wish they hadn't. I'd love to have that organ now. I have no idea where it is. Well, while we were in that building, they built the new high school, which is where we, it is now, only just the first unit of it. And in Christmas holidays of 1911, we moved the high school from up there over to the new high school here. That was in our, my senior year, in the middle of the senior year. We were so delighted. This was wonderful. We had a big auditorium on the first floor. And the room that I remember, especially our English room up on the second floor, we were studying Shakespeare, you know. So they made this English room like an old English room at the time of Shakespeare, furnished with pictures and painting and everything. So we, I still remember that English room. Well, in 1912, in that spring, we graduated. There were 28 of us in that senior class. I saved the newspaper that was printed the day of our graduation. And it was all coming to pieces, but I had it in a plastic bag and I gave it to the museum telling about our graduation exercise. Well, uh, 50 years after that, in 1962, I tried to locate the members of that graduating class. And I found five of them still living here in Eden, four besides myself. So we got together and had a class reunion after 50 years. <laughs> we haven't met each other for many, many years. But that, that was one of the time. Well, when we finished high school, I felt that I ought to go to work somewhere and earn some money. I wanted to go to college eventually, but I, money was scarce and dollars were hard to come by. So I said, well, I've had all this music training. Why don't I teach music? But there's plenty of music teachers in Enid, so I got on the Frisco train and went out here to Lahoma, the first little town, and canvassed that area and enrolled 20 students for piano lessons. Boys and girls, grades, you know. So every week from then on, for two days, I went to Lahoma every week and rode the train, and where I walked a couple of blocks when I got there, the first place I stopped had two children to take music lessons. I charged 50 cents a lesson. Instead of their paying me a dollar, they gave me their horse and buggy to use for two days to drive all around the home and the little farms and give these 20 music lessons. Where I stayed all night, there were two children I could give music lessons to pay that they'd take care of me and the horse overnight. 
Well, and then I come back to you and I save enough money to have someone to pay my tuition and get started in films. <laughs> well, uh, I'm ready, ready for college. <laughs> I wonder if there's something else along the line that ought to be told. Phillips, as you know, came here in 1907. The day, the very week that they opened their doors to receive students, my mother took me out there and enrolled me for piano. I'd been studying piano and organ. But Doc, Professor Dykstra House was in charge of all the music in Phillips. He taught all the band and orchestra instruments, piano and organ, everything. So he taught me piano for several years. And then, now I was in the seventh grade then. It was 1907. In 1913, I had Phillips as a freshman in the fall. I went out there to enroll as a freshman. Um, the tuition was $50 a semester. You take all you wanted. Now you pay by the hour and you maybe pay two or $3,000 a semester. But that was a Christian school and they were to train Christian workers and ministers. And if you were in the Bible college, the tuition was $25 a semester, half price, to encourage them. My older sister and I had decided that we wanted, we interested in the church life, the Christian life. We wanted to do something worthwhile with our lives, so we enrolled in the Bible college. Now, did that click off? Yeah, turn it on. That clicked off. Let me see how, what did I say that was when we started? The Bible college. It's been going a little over, about a half an hour. You were telling me that uh, Phillips was a Bible college. Okay. My folks sold their home over on West Oak Street. They had three daughters to get through college. Said you just well move out there. So they bought a home at 1609 East Main so that we were in walking distance of the campus. This was a big three-story house. But my mother knew she was going to have to take borders and rumors to get us all through college. And on the second floor, there were six bedrooms, which she rented to young men students. They were all ministerial students. She charged them three dollars and a half a month, a week, for a board and room. And when they went out to preach on the weekends, they docked her a dollar. Oh. So they were going part of Saturday and Sunday. But that, the third story had three bedrooms where we lived. Now, when the doors would open in the morning and those people all began coming out and head for Phillips, the neighbors or anybody on the streetcar going by in front would say, that looks just like a beehive, bees coming out the hive. So that building was, became officially known as the beehive. Oh. And for a number of years it was there, students boarding and rooming there, living in the beehive. And we walked town. Now mostly the students walked downtown too. They saved their nickels and didn't ride that streetcar very much unless they were in a hurry. Well, a whole bunch of us had done their 15s and walked together and just had a lot of fun as we walked downtown. But uh, the, the uh, old beehive does not stand there anymore, but I, the big maple tree is still there. I can locate the place as I look at it. Now, in my junior year in Phillips, I realized that it was a terrible hardship on my mother to pay our expenses. There was other things to pay besides tuition. Books, and clothing, and you know, everything, and, and the living of the family and all. So I decided I'd drop out of college and teach school. I went to summer school and took a teaching training course and got a teacher certificate for one year. I applied and got a school three miles south of Hunter, a rural little one-room schoolhouse. And I taught there that year. Now that was a seven-month school. Didn't run nine months, you see. I got $50 a month and I paid $12 a month board and room at a farmer that lived close to the schoolhouse. From Enid, I would get on the Frisco Railroad and go up there. This six miles, this side of Hunter, was a flag station. The railroad had set an extra boxcar there, and if anybody won the train, they could stop there and flag the train. It would stop and pick them up. So on Monday morning, I ride out to that flag station, and either I walk the three miles from my school, or the man where I boarded would sometimes meet me with a buggy and take me. But on Friday nights, when I came back to Enid, in the winter it was dark, 
and this man would drive me there and let me out of the buggy and he'd go on. In that boxcar one well, Friday night, there were three men. We called them tramps or bums. Men, homeless men wandering mm -hmm. the country in that boxcar. I wouldn't go in, of course. I was frightened to death. But pretty soon I saw the train coming. I stood in the middle of the railroad track and fried the train and got on <laughs> to get back home. Mm -hmm. Now, on Saturdays, every weekend when I came to Egypt, I was enrolled in courses at Phillips. I took classes all day long and kept up with what my class was doing. So the next year I graduated with my senior class. But I saved money that year. Even though I only cleared $38 a month, I saved enough money to put me through my senior year. Of course, I better should confess that the middle of my senior year, I married a preacher, <laughs> a preacher student. <laughs> and uh, then, then we rented an apartment for $3 a month, a little upstairs apartment, where we both graduated the same year. Well, we finished Phillips. We began our 50-year ministry. But these things that I have described give a little bit of what life was like in Enid for the, what, how many years? up until the 1920s, say, mm -hmm. from the 93 to the 1920s, 30 years, those early days. I have so many memories. I could think of a dozen more stories I could tell. I could fill the book, and sometimes I think I may. <laughs> you do need to write all this down. <laughs> You're very interesting. You have a lot of interesting memories and stories. And did you, you want to tell me when you were born? I was born in Houghton, Kansas, in December 17, 1893, the same year of the run. Oh. And do you want to tell us how old you are? Well, if I was born in 93, that makes me kind of old. You see, it's 90 <laughs> now. I am 96. Oh, well. And at the end of this year, I'll be 97. When is your birthday? December, December. week before Christmas. <laughs> well, what did your grandparents do? What is it? Your grandparents, what, what did they do? Well, my, these are my mother's grandparents. Uh -huh. He made the run, built the hotel. They lived mm -hmm. here all, all those years. He was on the school board. He was on the city council. He was involved from the beginning, mm -hmm. you know, in the building up of Enid. Well. And they had a family. The other children, younger than my mother, several of them were high school age when they came here. And they grew up married and settled around in relatives all over the country. Oh. My mother was one of 12 children, so I had 44 first cousins. <laughs> you have lots of relatives. I have a lot here yet. Did you help your mother in the kitchen? I helped her some, not too much. Mother knew that she couldn't handle that very well, and she hired a woman to work for her who lived there and stayed with us and did most of the kitchen work. My mother worked too, but the <laughs> cooking for that big group, you see, all the time, and doing the laundry and take care of all these rooms. Mm -hmm. She wasn't able to do it, and we girls old enough to help were in college. So she, we had help. Do you remember the flu epidemic of 1918? Yes, I do. That was a year after we were married, and uh, I had the flu very severely mm -hmm. myself that winter. I remember it very much. Life I, people, it was terrible. Lot and the doctors didn't know how to cope with it. It was something new. Mm -hmm. They didn't know how to handle it now. What do you remember doing for recreation? Did you go to dances or socials? Well, you know, it was a sin to dance <laughs> when I grew up. <laughs> to dance or to play cards or to drink were sins that we didn't do. Now, when I was in high school, I danced a little. <laughs> our, our junior and senior classes, you know, gave parties, and we danced. I don't know whether my mother knew that or not. <laughs> but uh, I remember one time a friend was visiting us, an old gentleman that was there spending a couple of days with us, and he sat and played some cards. And mother let him because he's an old man, you know. Mm -hmm. But the preacher was going to come and call on Mother. And when she saw him coming, she sure got those cards out of sight. <laughs> that was the sin. We wouldn't touch them ourselves. <laughs> when, uh, when my oldest son was married and they gave a big ball at a country club, I danced again. Oh. <laughs> Do you remember Statehood Day in 1907? Statehood Day in 1907. Do you have any? I have no special relation of that. I should have. Now, one of the, the things I gave the museum was this. A, uh, diploma-like thing, I don't know what you call it, that showed that when 
a president of the United States came to Oklahoma City. The governor was the selected man over the state to welcome him, and my father was chosen to represent this area to meet that president in Oklahoma City. And that was about in 1910. Mm -hmm. And he was involved in things like that, but I don't remember statehood. He was a good Democrat and did all kinds of things for the party. <laughs> Do you have any memories about World War One or World War Two? Yes, at, when World War we were married at the time of World War One, mm -hmm. and they were drafting all the young men. You know, they didn't draft very many of the ministerial students, but some they did. Depend on their situations. My husband went and volunteered for it, but the war ended right away soon after we were married, where he was never called up, so he never was in the military service. But I remember distinctly at that time. Mm -hmm. World War II, where was I? For 50 years we were in ministries around different states. Mm -hmm. What date was the world? It would have been 41 to 45. We were in a church in Oklahoma City at that time. I, I don't remember that it affected us as much except that times were hard and money was scarce and, and mm -hmm. it was a tense time for everybody, but we weren't involved as far as the war was concerned. Mm -hmm. Those sandstorms you were telling me about, was that during the Dust Bowl in the yes, 30s? Yes, I suppose so. Yeah. It, it, it began before that, but it continued mm -hmm. for a number of years. I think it must be because of wheat fields are put to wheat or something that holds the soil. Mm -hmm. We don't have that anymore. Did the Depression hit you pretty hard? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. We were at Holdenville at a church when the Depression came. And churches, like other businesses, cut salaries. Mm -hmm. And even though you lived in a church parsonage, I went back to school teaching. I had a lifetime teacher's high school certificate when I graduated from Phillips. Mm -hmm. And I went back to teaching in the high school there to help us. And when my oldest son was a senior in high school, I was his English teacher oh. at Holdenville. Well. <laughs> This may seem like a silly question, but were you a flapper? No, not really. <laughs> Did you bob your hair? What? Did you bob your hair? I wanted to cut my hair. Everybody else did. But I had hair that came down to the tips of my fingers when my arms hung down. Oh. And beautiful long hair, you know. And my husband wouldn't let me cut my hair. <laughs> we were in Grand Junction, Colorado. And finally, I begged and begged. And he decided everybody had their hair cut with me. And finally, we braided one long braid, and he took the scissors to cut it off, and uh, then he let me go to the beauty shop to get it arranged. <laughs> that would have been about 1920. Well. 18 or 20, something like mm -hmm. that. Did you know anyone that rode on the Chisholm Trail, or have any stories of about that? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I knew of it, I knew about it, but I mm -hmm. had no special knowledge of it. Well, can you think of anything else that you'd like to tell me about during your church service uh, or your ministry? Well, or this one little incident I meant to tell, the first building that our church had, as I said, on West Randolph, we lived over on East Maple, that when there were no sidewalks or pavements, if it rained, we walked through mud. And on rainy Sundays, to go to Sunday school, we children would carry our shoes and stockings. Shoes cost a dollar a pair, and you couldn't get them all muddy and spoil them. And so mother carried a towel. When we got to church, there was a little pump there by the side of that church. We washed our feet and put on our shoes and stockings so we were fit to go into the house of the Lord. Well. <laughs> but that was common, you know, uh -huh. mud. How about uh, circuses and rodeos? Do you remember? Oh, yes. My father was a judge, and when the circus came to end, he got complimentary tickets every year. We never missed a circus. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, it was just a wonderful time, of course. And after the circus was over, all of us children in the neighborhood would try to do the things we'd seen done at the circus. Our cellar door, I told you we had a cellar under mm -hmm. our kids. The cellar door sloped down. We took an old barrel and put the top of that cellar door, and two of us would hold it while one got in it, and then we'd let it roll down the cellar door and on down the hill, like they would roll a big ball down something, you know, and jump over in it shut up in a big ball at the circus. <laughs> and we make, made our swing into a trapeze so we could act on the trapeze in the backyard. 
Did the circus come to town every year? Yes, mm -hmm. after the month started, mm -hmm. they came every year. And it was Ringling Brothers? And the, yes, uh -huh. Uh -huh. and they, where did they camp? They usually camped east of the Rock Island down there where there's some open ground. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you ever go to any medicine shows? I think I must have. I have no clear ministry of it, but I remember we had them. Mm -hmm. And Mother used to buy some medicine from them. Mm -hmm. How did you celebrate your holidays? How? Uh huh. Did you have any special? Well, if it was nice weather, we'd have picnics. Mm -hmm. You know, we'd go to Government Springs Park, or a group of a group of us from the church. Once a year, we'd have a big church picnic. We'd get hay racks. Several farmers were bringing hay racks, and we'd go off out to Creek or River somewhere, maybe out to Lakewood, and have a big picnic. And. Uh, when they first began having vacation Bible schools, they didn't call it that. Just a summer church having a little summer school to take care of the children. The Methodist Church first had them, and I remember going there to a vacation Bible school. And when I must have been eight or nine years old, and we learned to sew and make doll clothes. Well, but I, I can remember that one. And then soon all the churches began doing it. Who do you think is the greatest man in American history? American history? Well, I suppose the first thing we'd all say, Abraham Lincoln, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think you can name one. It's hard. You know, that would be better, greater than all. Who do you think is the greatest woman in American history? I don't know, but I forgot to tell you about one great woman that came here, Dean, and okay. Harry Nation. Did you ever oh, hear that name? Oh, no. Let me to hear that story. Well, yeah. she was a woman who was set out to destroy all the saloons in Kansas first before they went dry. And she carried a hatchet, and she went from town to town. She'd walk into a saloon and use that hatchet and break everything up. And finally, Kansas went dry, I think it was largely by her efforts. Mm -hmm. Well, she came to Oklahoma. When she came down here, she was our guest. Her husband married my parents way back years ago in Kansas. By the way, a hundred years ago, last Monday, my parents was my, my parents' wedding day, mm -hmm. May the 1st. Yeah. Well, she came to Oklahoma, and she was the guest in our house, and she had little silver hatchets that people bought to remember what she did. She beat the saloons up in Enid, too, just smashed them all up, broke everything breakable. And she'd give a big lecture while she was here that everybody went to. And uh, she helped to bring dry mm -hmm. laws to Oklahoma. Everybody wore these little silver hatchets on, pinned on them and would wear them for a long time. <laughs> Talk about Carrie Nation. <laughs> she was a great woman. <laughs> Nobody ever dared to arrest her for that. No, they just got out of her way. <laughs> uh, who do you think was the greatest American president? I would claim to name one. Would you? Well, it'd be hard because they all have done good things. We've had a lot of light and wonderful presents. We've had some that weren't so wonderful. <laughs> that's right. Well, that's all the questions that I have. Uh, you know, it's okay. strange how people are interested in their past. Mm -hmm. And I have the genealogies of the four branches of my family out here, all the books, the pictures, the collections. But Everybody's interested in knowing something about their ancestors. What I am was determined partly by what I inherited and partly by my circumstances, the way I grew up in Eden. Your circumstances or your ancestry. So we like to know what our ancestors were like. Everybody does. Mm -hmm. and we remember these things. I've had letters from relatives way off. They know I have these history records of families wanting information about a certain grandparent or great grandparent or something that happened. But I have uh, the material that will let any of our relatives belong to the daughter, to the uh, DAR, the Daughters mm -hmm. of the American Republic, mm -hmm. things like this. And it's valued. The number of my grandchildren want all of that. I don't know who will get it, mm -hmm. but they want to keep it. You've worked a good many years to yes. find all those relatives, haven't you? Is that uh, hard to do? No, not really. It takes time. Mm -hmm. I maybe don't do it adequately, but 
for instance, I had recently a little great-granddaughter there born back in New Jersey. <laughs> and when I got that announcement, they told me they had named her Amanda. I said, wonderful, that's an old family name. And I got out that branch of my mother's family and outlined from a way back come down to her, and I find the name Amanda four times in there. Oh. <laughs> and they didn't even know that. <laughs> uh, but it's interesting to have this information. Mm -hmm. and I often make up a certain charge of one line to send somebody that wants it. Mm -hmm. Well, I know that. I have two sons. One of them, the first one was born here in England in 1919. He graduated from OU, then went to Chicago, and then Columbia. And he is now the faculty of Yale University. My other son was born in Colorado, but he graduated from Phillips in 1948. And they were both ordained ministers. My younger son was a missionary in Japan. And when we retired, after 52 years, we made a trip to the Orient to visit them in Japan. We went all around the countries over there, Dovinas, Hong Kong, Japan, Korea, everywhere. We were gone 10 months from home. Made the trip there and visited them in Japan. It was so a nice trip. That must have been for you. You had a wonderful, mm -hmm. wonderful life. Mm -hmm. I've been in this house now 25 years. Oh. Been a widow mm -hmm. for 20 years. Mm -hmm. but, uh, at my age, I'm very thankful for be able to get around as well as I do. Yes, you amaze me. Do you have grandchildren? I have seven grandchildren and eight great great eight great grandchildren. Mm. I have three granddaughters and four grandsons. And they're all scattered, none of them around here. They most of them went back east to go to college. They just stayed back there. Oh. <laughs> but I have a few in the West Coast that are scattered. They, they, they visit me. Up until about three years ago every year, I would fly back to New York and visit all my family back there. But after that, I didn't feel like doing it. And I said, now from now on, you visit me. <laughs> so my sons come every year, and some of the grandchildren visit me. I have a sister here in town, and a lot of nieces and nephews from my older sister's family. <laughs> You said there were three in your family. You have a sister living here in Enid? Yes. Uh-huh. When, when uh, we were getting ready to retire, my parents owned this house next door and lived there for many years. And they wrote me, we were ready to retire, that this house had come up for sale. Mm -hmm. So they arranged that we bought it so we could live here next to them. So that when we, we retired, we moved in here quick, and then we made our trip to the Orient. Mm -hmm. Then came back and sold it. But in three months after we moved in, my mother died, so we never did get to live next to her. Oh, well. But that's how we happened to be here. Mm -hmm. However, since I grew up in Nina, this is where we want to retire. Mm -hmm. My husband came from Minnesota, and up there the winters, you know, long, hard, cold winters. When the first date we ever had, there used to be a lake out there, but the Phillips campus, I think there's a small one still there. Mm -hmm. In the winter, that would freeze over so we could skate on it. And the first date we ever had, he took me skating on the lake and tried to teach me ice skating. I had never done it. <laughs> At least he kept me from falling down. <laughs> I never learned to skate. <laughs> but uh, those days in the end, and it was good to have all of our relatives here. Go up with loved ones around. Memor memories are wonderful, aren't they? Yes, they are. I just think, how could we live without mm -hmm. remembering? We make a lot of mistakes because we learn about some things. <laughs> That's right. Learn from our mistakes. <clears throat> I, uh, I've been out there twice to the museum, and I've both times I left without going through it. Oh. Well, you My must. older son, I wrote him about it. He says, Mother, you took me to the museum and showed me all through it, and I can't remember this. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I did. Oh, yeah. But uh, I hope that people of Venus will enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Make use of it. Phillips started having a, a museum, you know. Yes. In, and then they needed the building for something else. Mm -hmm. They packed up everything, put away. I had given them a lot of things. Oh. Mm -hmm. Some of them I wish you had them. 
Well, our museum used to be out to Phillips so a long time ago. Well, is it the same one they had? Do you have all those things? Well, uh, if you gave it out there, it's the sons and daughters of the Cherokee Strip Pioneers. It's their collection. Well, maybe, the, maybe they're there. I hope they are. In the city hotel my grandfather built, out in front, he had eight big wooden chairs there where mm -hmm. the guests could sit. They were what was called a captain's chair. You know what that mm -hmm. is? I had one. I gave it to that museum. Do yeah. you have we it? We have it. Good. I gave that to <laughs> uh -huh. him. That sat in front of the old city well, hotel. I asked him if a city hotel. I said something about that chair And downstairs. I think I told him the history of it, where uh -huh. it came from. Yeah, that's true. Well, that's good. So I'm glad to know. I it. thought those things were just packed away somewhere. No. They moved them when they built the museum, the well, I'm building. I'm so happy to know mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking, maybe if they were, I could get them out of there. <laughs> well, they just outgrew the place at, at yes. Phillips. Yes, they needed mm -hmm. the space for something yeah. else. And we're going to be building a new addition and an elevator oh. soon as we can raise some money. Well, I want to come out one of these days again and go uh -huh. through the museum. Then I'll remember having yeah. seen it. Mm -hmm. But the, when I was out there a week or two ago, I, I left without taking mm -hmm. time to do that. Yeah. Well, we thank you for sharing all your memories with us today. Well, you're most welcome. I'm glad to do it. I hope that it'll be understandable. Oh, I'm sure it will. Thank you so much, Mrs. Rosslyn. Well, I thank you for coming and going to this trouble to do it. Surely it was my pleasure.